Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Dr. Cesar Corso, who is the Lehman Chair for Swine Health and Production at the University of Minnesota. Cesar, how are you today? I'm doing very well, Laura. Thanks for inviting. Yes, well, we're glad to have you on today. Um, before we really get started on our topic, maybe take a couple of minutes here and, and help our audience understand a little bit about you and your background. Sure, sure. So I'm originally from Colombia. So I got my bed degree in Colombia. It's going to be actually 20 years uh, this summer, 20 years ago. And then I had the chance to move to Canada. I lived in Canada for two years while I was getting my master's uh, at the University of Guelph. Then I went back home. I joined the Elanco team in the technical side. So I had the opportunity to travel throughout South and Central America um, and working with customers. Then in 2008, I arrived in Minnesota to get my PhD with uh, Dr. Bob Morrison and uh, Dr. Marie Cohane. And then in 2012, I joined PIC as the, as the lead of the health team uh, in Latin America. And then in 2017, I joined the University of Minnesota as the, as the Lehman Chair in Swine Health and Productivity. And since then, I've been doing a little bit of everything, but most importantly, leading this uh, very large uh, Swine Health Monitoring Project from which we have a lot of uh, tentacles from a project perspective, whether it's uh, PERS, PD, Seneca, right? So uh, it's been uh, an interesting career and quite busy. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, let's talk a little bit about that surveillance program that you're doing. Maybe um, start there. Give the audience a little bit more background about what that is. Yes. So this all started, I think, uh, based on conversations about PERS and um, the frustration that the virus has been generating in the industry uh, when comparing years and years of uh, PERS seasons, right? So I think that's when Dr. Morrison said, well, if we start tracking it a little bit better, we're going to be able to compare it uh, more from an objective perspective, right? Because there's going to be years in which one producer gets hit really bad. Um, so he's going to say this year's per season is bad, but then his neighbor didn't get hit hard. So he says it wasn't that bad as, as last year, but there's no objective comparison. So that's how it started. I want to say in 2010, 2011, uh, so as that, those conversations started, Bob designed this really nice, neat, very simplistic way of tracking breaks, right? In breeding herds, right? So since then, we have a body of producers, uh, clinics, uh, regional projects reporting on a weekly basis and then on a voluntary basis, whether they had an outbreak, one, uh, for PERS, or two, whether their status has been improved, meaning I went from category one to category two or category three to category four. So we keep track of that uh, on at least 50% of the breeding herd in the United States, right? Now, as, as time went by, uh, Bob added PED, then Delta coronavirus. We're also tracking today's Seneca and then the central nervous system viruses. So today we have, I think, the beauty of a voluntary system that is by for the producers, right? But that also serves as a tool that if tomorrow we have we get in trouble with a with a very nasty virus or pathogen, uh, we can use that if the regulatory agencies need to use the data, right? Hopefully, we don't need to use that, but uh, it's there, right? Because we have locations, we have herd sizes, we have whether the farms are filtered or not. And now we're expanding to the growing finishing population, right? So we're just building this huge database that uh, has kind of endless endless possibilities from a research perspective, but also we want this to be useful for the industry should an emergency occur. Yes, and that's something we can still find on online, correct? We can go onto your website and see where we're at in terms of surveillance. Is that true? Exactly. So we're we're in the process of trying to well, so so that's online. So we and we also produce a report right that gets uh, shared uh, on a weekly basis. But we're now in the process of uh, overhauling our website just so that 
people that do not want to get the report on a weekly basis, they can just go and see, oh, this is where the graph, the purge graph is at this time of the year, right? Yeah. And those have always been really useful um, from production perspective. I know we've used them in the past to decide what are we doing in terms of feed mitigations and so forth if we're concerned about PED transmission, et cetera, is trying to follow and, and look for those trends and patterns. So the data that's been generated over the years through Morrison and, and your crew has been phenomenal and extremely useful to the industry. Um, so we thank you for that. Thank you very much. I mean, I mean if, it wasn't, if it wasn't for the effort of the industry and for the willingness to share, we wouldn't be able to say, well, this year wasn't as bad as last year, right? Or with the recent event with this new strain of PERS, we said, why in the world are we seeing an outbreak that large with such a magnitude in the summer when we've never seen that before, right? So that's what the data is there for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's kind of jump into that. Um, one of the things I think that surprised me in the last few years is PERS, and particularly some of the strains we've been dealing with recently. You know, we, we just had a podcast with Jim Lowe and, and some of his perception of what's happening with PERS. Um, but I think it's an interesting note is that in the past, I remember some, some strains kind of hanging on through the summer, but more recently, it seems to be pretty intense. So maybe explain what you're seeing in terms of surveillance and, and PERS. Let's start there. So, yeah, and that's a good question. You know, that's a very direct, easy to answer question, depending on how deep into the weeds we want to get into. But it's very relevant, Laura, because there's so many different layers of data. For example, we know that every year we have an epidemic, right? Uh, we know that that epidemic, our database that it's mainly looking at sow farms is telling us that will start sometime in October or November, right? So meaning the fall, when there's a lot of activity in certain areas of the country, when it comes to manure pumping and things like that. And then that epidemic will end in, uh, I want to say, March, April, May. It kind of varies a little bit. And then we have a little blip during the summer, and then the whole cycle starts again. When we look at that same data, year after year, we can see that somewhere between 20 to 30% of the herds in the database uh, report an outbreak, right? So we say, okay, that's a, that's kind of what, what we see the ranges. Now, we need to be careful when we compare year years just because the project has been evolving over time. Some new systems have been uh, onboarded. And not necessarily all those systems have their farms located in the same place as the systems that had joined at the beginning of the project. Meaning that, as you know, Laura, the Midwest, Southern, I don't know, Southern Minnesota, Northern Iowa, the risk for PERS is completely different to, I don't know, Northwest Nebraska, you know, Wyoming, things like that. So that's where we need to be a little bit careful with it. However, the trend, just because we have Half of this, half of the U.S. breeding herd on the project, it's already giving us a good sense of okay, this year is looking kind of similar, or is looking better or worse, right? So that's when we start seeing things like okay, the first season will start; it should end at some point. With the latest one, it was kind of yep, it was embedded in that uh, epidemic. And when it was supposed to end, we see the whole new curve again. And again, a new strain, uh, not much immunity out there to this strain. So lots of farms start blowing up. Uh, but the surprising thing was why in the summer we saw the continuation of a second wave. That's how we called it, the second wave of transmission, uh, given that we all thought that in the summer diseases are supposed to spread at a lower rate, well, some people like to think that way. I don't think it's always the case. Pathogens do not disappear. They'll just are circulating at a lower prevalence. But this one looks like this virus was um, it's more equipped or better equipped than the previous strains, right? So that's what we saw with this, with this new strain. Mm -hmm. well, that's very interesting. So what are some different approaches we should be thinking about now that we kind of identify that, well, there are some strains that maybe are not going to follow that typical PERS pattern that we've, we've anticipated over the years. 
And that's a good question, you know, and, that, and this is where I start thinking about the challenge to us is, well, uh, do we have any unrecognized transmission routes, right? That uh, Because we, I think we have a good grasp us as far as PERS is transmitted mainly through these routes, but are there any others? One, so that's, a, that's the approach of, should we start testing something uh, that we haven't tested before? I know that some folks were pretty uh, proactive and aggressive and they start testing some feed, right? Finished feed. Um, that's that's a good way to, to look at. Or there's other approaches like uh, testing the filters, right? So here within the group, Dr. Tormura did some testing for, for flu and person filters, air filters. Things like that, I think that's that's gonna happen. But now at the farm level, when we see these breaks occurring in areas where they hadn't seen PERS ever, perhaps. The question is, what happened here? Yeah, I know that some people are investing time and money on the investigation, but uh, I wonder if we need to start investing a little bit more time and money on how can we measure biosecurity compliance? Let's just make sure that we don't let that fall through the cracks in the sense that, yep, we have a system in place, but is the system performing as it is supposed to be performing, right? I'm not saying that all of, all of the all of the listeners out there that have a truck wash and that are disinfecting uh, are doing things wrong. No, but what I can tell you is that whenever I go to the dentist, the dentist highlights the fact that I am not flossing really well in these two three spots, and I start thinking, okay, that's my job. That was my responsibility, and I was doing it, but I'm not doing it correctly. So then when I use these kind of silly examples, I say, I, I, I say to myself, what's happening at the farm level? You know, what's happening at the truck wash? What's happening in the feed meal? Uh, we know that we have a process in place, but are we really making sure that that process is effective, that it's being done every single day uh, with every single event uh, and so forth, you know? So I think that's going to be the approach because I think we know that we can keep First out, I mean, we've been keeping PED at bay uh, for quite a long while. Yeah, we still have some hot spots, but after that massive outbreak, I think everybody became so aware of it that they were able to stop it. So now PERS kind of did the same thing. Yep, it came and slapped it us in the face really bad uh, because it's just a massive outbreak and it continues, but it got to areas where we never thought it would get to. And again, maybe the virus was a little bit more equipped. Some folks have said, yeah, very low CT values, lots of shedding. Well, that's when biosecurity comes in and, and we should think, well, are we overwhelming our system? Or is it our system that was not prepared or was not being uh, performing as it was supposed to be performing when we see this amount of virus, right? So I think that could be the approach nowadays because Certainly, we dragged it in somehow. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, air, transport, animals, uh, semen, uh, fomites, you name it. Uh, but that's all I want to say that that mostly is under our control, right? So uh, somehow we did something, uh, I don't want to say wrong, but maybe there's still opportunities out there to fine tune that uh, those programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point because I've been involved in some of those farms that break and you look at the strain type and geographically it's it's nowhere near where that farm is located. And so you're 100 miles, 200 miles away and and you can't easily connect the dot. And and so how do you help those producers that are in that spot? So you're talking about biosecurity compliance, but when you don't really know how it's coming in, how do you help? How do you do that validation of compliance? And, that, and that's a great point, you know, because that's kind of like the typical needle on the haystack conversation, right? Because we're going to go to those farms and they're going to tell us, yeah, we we use the bench system. We have uh, feed mitigants. We have filters. We, we bake all their trailers. Um, so I think that's we know that there's a base for that biosecurity, which I think it's valid. That's that's already head start. But then that's when we're going to have to start, I don't know if the word policing would be the case, but uh, we're just going to have to start little by little, making sure that we make all these uh, 
uh, surprise visits, if you will, or if we're going to have to start using, I know some folks have been using some cameras and the cameras don't show uh, much, but the one thing that I realized with cameras is that we can only see what the, where the camera is pointing at. Are there any other areas, right? Uh, another one that I think we need to start thinking about is mortality management, right? Is mortality management something that we look at? Well, some people will say, yeah, rendering, that's fine. Yeah, rendering, that's what we do. How are we doing that rendering process, right? How are we managing that uh, that disposal of those of the mortality, right? Are we doing that in a biosecure manner? And the reason I say this, Laura, is because throughout this frustration, because I mean, this whole process, again, frustrated me as well in the sense that how in the world we cannot understand how this virus is transmitting when we've been in this world for three, four decades already, and again, it does the same thing. So we did a small, a very, very small assessment as far as environmental contamination positive farms for this strain. We couldn't find much except for the fact that we found some traces on doorknobs, external doorknobs, or we found it on, um, on the floor on the external side of the bench, right? So we said, we're not supposed to find these traces of virus in here. On, on these surfaces, so I said, we're moving it out somehow. So I said, okay, no wonder. But so what? I said, well, I think we need to keep digging as far as those positive farms need to be, uh, need to, I should say, we need to be more careful when it comes to the biocontainment part, right? Because we're moving it out. And that's how we may be contaminating something else. Uh, but I think that's where we have a huge black box in the sense that we think we're doing things correctly, but maybe we're not. So I think there's opportunities there that for the folks that think from a biosecurity perspective every day, I know that it's hard to tell them, go and check again. Well, we're going to have to go and check again because somehow it's getting in, right? And uh, we assume that everything is perfectly fine when maybe it's not. And it happens in hospitals. Nurses seem to have some rate of uh, not complying when it comes to washing their hands after they visited a patient. It happens in hospitals, so maybe we could assume that it may be happening in an, at our farms. Maybe that's the case. Yeah, I think you bring up a couple really interesting points. Um, years ago, I was involved in a study where we were just sampling farms, so we were sampling the Danish entry area, the refrigerators where the employees put their food and so forth. And we were trying to find PERS coming in. Okay, so that was the whole goal is can we take these farms that we know are near PERS farms and see if we can maybe find the virus, much like what you were just doing. Um, but unfortunately that was the winter the PED hit. And so we had all these samples for the farms. We're like, well, why not, right? We already have them from, from what we were doing. And we saw the same thing that um, right after PED hit, we were having it in the em employees' lunches, you know, in their refrigerators, right, where they're having their lunches, or we'd find it outside on door handles and those types of things, mm -hmm. even before the farm would necessarily say, hey, we have a problem, right? So PED, as fast as it was moving and as, as easy as it was to, to, you know, recognize there was a problem within a 12-hour window on a farm, we were already successfully moving it well before then. And so I think you bring up a good point because we talk a lot about what's coming into the farm, but we don't necessarily talk as much about how we work inside the farm, particularly sow farms, right? We know we know we work youngest to oldest and we do those things, but still sow dies and we have to go back into a room or, or whatever. And so I think you raise an interesting point about how to think about that internal um, biosecurity. And, and you know what, as, as you mentioned, we're always basing a lot of our conclusions uh, on the testing date. So if I go ahead and test on, I don't know, January 15th, and my outbreak occurs on January, I don't know, 20th, I'm always gonna say, but I was negative on January 15th. That's when we need to challenge ourselves and say, well, yeah, the January 15th testing yielded negative results, but we have to remember that maybe we missed it very likely. 
and we have some some pretty cool simple data from that's with Seneca, a student of ours, Guillermo Praise. He did a little bit of uh, uh, monitoring on processing fluids for Seneca. There were some farms, Laura, that were uh, generating PCR positive results in processing fluids. I think it was like two or three weeks before the outbreak was uh, the, before the outbreak. So he said, "Okay, that's kind of interesting because." The bug was already in there. Maybe nobody had realized that the bug is, was in there. And we just kept our normal lives uh, without segregating, without uh, raising awareness, maybe with some biosecurity opportunities here and there. I think the same thing happens with PERS, right? It gets into these herds, for stays there for a little bit, and not until it gets to those, uh, I guess, to the very pregnant sows that start aborting, you know, those are the ones that are going to tell us there's something wrong or the baby pigs. Not until it gets to enough of those, we start thinking, okay, there's something wrong here. The question is for how long that virus has been in there. Uh, I think that's something that we need to work ourselves, work a little bit more so that ourselves, ourselves change that mentality of we need to go back and really investigate what were the events on because we always do the, what is it, the one month uh, investigation, right? Uh, maybe here we might be able to pinpoint it into, is it this week or that week? But it's gonna go from one month to two weeks, right? Uh, it, it's still hard, right? But uh, there's so many things happening at the farm level that it's gonna be always hard to pinpoint one, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And I think I think that's really an intriguing thought process too. Um, because we do we do think about that quite frequently. The I can always remember right PERS break happens today. Well, were there antibodies present or not? Because if there's no antibodies in those blood samples, well then it only happened in the last two weeks. And we view PERS as moving through farms relatively quickly. Um, but you're absolutely right. I can I can recall farms having the same strain of PERS and one where you have high mortality and another where it maybe looks more like flu than it did even a PERS virus. And so the variation of the virus, how it moves through that genetic population, I think it's all pieces that while we try to catch in, in big general pieces, we might be missing some of those those smaller nuances. Yep, yep. I think COVID told us, well, taught us a little bit of that, right? In the sense that, uh, in some populations, it really, really, uh, really spread really well. In other populations, we're just surprised and it didn't spread as much as we thought, right? Uh, but also the clinical part of it, some people really, really got very, very, I mean, they got sick really bad. Others, they didn't even, they didn't even knew they had it, right? So we always have all these different components to disease expression, transmission, the the AP triad, you know, that we always need to go back to those basics and start asking the hard questions. But most importantly, ask ourselves or train ourselves to better interpret the negative results, right? Because the positive, I think we know that we can interpret the positive. Even if it's a false positive, we can work through it. Uh, but it's the negatives, right? I go in there, this hair test is negative. Can I safely assume that the herd is negative with one test? Of course, a lot of people will say no. Um, but uh, for example, in this case, with the first one for the one C, we have some, uh, I want to say a few question marks as far as were the guilds actually purse free when they came in, right? Of course, nobody's going to bring in purse positive uh, guilds to the farm. Um, but because we have a specific monitoring schemes that we say, yep, six ropes, 10 ropes, whatever it is, the number, how confident do I feel that I'm getting to that level of, yep, I feel very, very comfortable that these kills don't have any virus. Well, when we go into the investigation, we see that most of the kills are PCR positive once they get into the G bar, right? So do we need to be a little bit more careful with the testing? in the GDUs, yes and no. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm referring to as far as we need to be careful with interpreting the negatives. Again, I know that we cannot go out there and test every single guilt, but maybe we can spend a little bit more 
more time or more money increasing our sample size or doing a little bit, a little bit more testing events, right? Just so that we build that confidence. We won't be able to say, there's always going to be uncertainty between sample collection and test results. That's going to be a, I don't know, one day, day and a half, two days. And then we have in some cases transport. So we're going to have to live with that uncertainty anyways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Well, as we wrap up, I see our time is about up. So would you mind giving just a couple of key points for our audience or key takeaways that you'd like for them to think about from our conversation today? Yeah, so I think I would start with uh, some um, the, the complicated one, which is I think this event with the latest strain, uh, we've seen that before several times, right? Uh, and, and it will happen again. Uh, just because we're just having too many pers positive pigs going around, right? The, the point that I want to make with this is let's try to figure out a way to really work towards uh, avoiding continuous flow pers PCR positive populations, right? The reason I'm saying this is just because the more we have those populations uh, housed in high dense regions, the higher the chances we're going to give this, these viruses to recombine, which the lightest uh, event is a recombination, which I think we all knew. But the, the lower the probability of that happening, the better for us, right? So that we can avoid that recombination. So that would be point one. Let's work towards avoiding continuous flow per PCR populations. The second one is one thing would... Yeah, that's taking care of the pathogen. The other, the other thing is taking care of the environment, meaning uh, what can we do from an environmental standpoint? Well, can we actually make sure that the environment or the tools around that environment is they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? Meaning a lot of, I know that a lot of people spend a lot of time washing, disinfecting, but let's make sure that we're always doing what's right for the pig in that sense as far as, hey, how do I keep this virus from getting close to my farm? Meaning trucks, people, uh, uh, supplies. Let's make sure that all those processes are in place that are being followed on a daily basis, right? So I think that's, that's key. And third, um, and most important, I want to say, let's train ourselves to interpret the negatives in a way that not that we're going to be uh, that we're going to approach this situation with skepticism no let's just make sure that a negative is a good it's a good piece of news but let's just make sure that a negative will only be powerful if we add more negatives to it over time right just so that uh just so that we ha we don't jump into the conclusion of hey my herd is free just because of one test, right? So I think those three are going to be good uh, just so that we can start thinking about things or the problem from a different standpoint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's wonderful advice. Well, Caesar, as you know, some of the questions that we like to ask our guest speakers are, well, we just have a couple of three common ones. The first one is really around, you know, do you have a swine resource that you would recommend to the group? <sighs> Yeah, so I think I think uh, some of the listeners have heard this before, but I think diseases of swine. I, I have a combo of diseases of swine, and then I use the AASB library. That those two resources for me are good, uh, just because sometimes I like to go to the old literature um, and just learn from others that have reported uh, interesting. I mean, there's some really really cool and interesting case reports, very detailed. And I mean, those two texts or well, resources, I should say, have a really, really good information as far as different diseases. Um, and I think those summarize and save you a lot of time when it comes to, hey, I don't want to go through all the PubMed database. No, here will give me, this will be a good start when it comes to, uh, I want to call it swine scientific uh, uh, research uh, slash background information, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. How about something that's maybe not pig related? Are there any resources or books that you might recommend to the to the group? So I kind of go back and forth between infectious diseases and cars, right? Just because uh, <laughs> I like to read a little bit about the epidemiology at the at the human at the human health level, 
just to learn whether they have different approaches as far as understanding how diseases uh, or pathogens emerge, outbreak investigations. So I like to see a little bit of that diversity when it comes to approaches. So I read a little bit about uh, AP journals in, in, the, in, the, in human health, and maybe there's some books that uh, they talk about uh, epidemics around the world. So I like to read that, but I, so I don't have a specific test because I just go and read different pieces of all these different resources. But then the other part that I mix with that, which has nothing to do with it, it's cars. So I like typical guy that likes cars, but in my case, it's about racing and how can I make my car go faster and stuff faster. So there's a lot of geeky, a lot of uh, engineering stuff that I don't understand really well, but I like to read about it and uh, try to get closer to that uh, mechanic wannabe that uh, I'm not that hand. I mean, I can do certain things, but uh, I read a lot about that stuff. It's technical stuff. So that's where I, that's where my, my life goes around, right? So, yeah, those two. I think that's great, though. You you find something that's completely different. And I think, you know, that helps our minds so that when we are ready to focus back on work, we're, we're really into it. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's still great that you have a wonderful hobby. So awesome. Well, the last question I like to ask is really around um, if you can think of somebody in your life that you've defined as successful, what's a key characteristic or trait that they possess that has allowed them to become successful? Well, and that's a tricky one because I've seen uh, and I've known, I guess I've been fortunate because I've met so many successful people like everybody around the world, but I have seen that different individuals have different characteristics when it comes to that success, right? Um, so when I see success, I see words like perseverance, you know, like uh, drive. Uh, but uh, those individuals that I consider very successful, that I respect a lot, not that I don't, I mean, I have, a, I, have I respect everybody, but there's some that I respect really, really a lot are those that are really low profile individuals that don't like to brag, that they're just working hard, that uh, they don't like to show off, that they communicate really well, um, and that they're always asking for opinions, right? So they're always asking people for opinions on what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, so that's the kind of in successful individual that I see that I, at some point, if I want to be like that, that's the individual that I want to be like that, right? Uh, um, because you can work hard a lot. I mean, you can work smart a lot uh, every day. If, and that's good. That's great. But I feel like those individuals that are low-key, working hard, successful, they have a lot to teach to the world today, right? When In a world that, hey, it's not about me, it's about others. So I think that's the kind of individual that uh, that I see that they're successful in my mind. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful trait, for sure. Well, Caesar, I do want to thank you for your time again today. Um, for our audience, again, this is just a reminder. This is Dr. Caesar Corzo, who's at the University of Minnesota. Caesar, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Laura. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.